Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Library TechCast. Today we are joined by Michael Engelbrecht uh, from the uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. He is the uh, he is the ILS administrator there, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Riley Childs. I am a junior at Charlotte United Christian Academy, but in addition to being a student there, I am also the uh, library library manager and deal with all their um, information technology stuff and. Uh, library technologies and all the fun educational information technology stuff that everyone knows and loves. And I'm going to throw it over to Michael. Uh, Riley, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Engelbrecht and I am the uh, Library Automation Systems Analyst, which is the long way of saying that I handle the card catalog and the system that controls all the books, all the people that check out the books and keeps records of who's got what, and all the little systems that connect to them like our online patron access catalogs and the system that lets you dial in your telephone to find out if you have holds in and to renew books and a lot of little things uh, on the side. So I have my fingers in a lot of pies at the library. For a second there I thought you were talking about um, the old teletype call <laughs> dial in. I, I don't know why I thought about that and I was just thinking man that'd be so awesome. Not much of that much anymore. No. It would be as cool as that would be. I'm sure it's expensive. But um, we're just going to roll in. We just have a kind of like a quick little news bite, and then we're going to roll into our main topics. Um, uh, as you know, we've been talking about iPads and the specifically the iPad rollout in the Los Angeles school district. And one of the interesting things, um, I'm looking at uh, an article on the LA Times website right now. Um, the mixed reaction to the iPad rollout from LA teachers and administrators. Just 36% of teachers strongly favored continuing the tablet effort. So basically, it's not even half of the teachers agreed. And it goes on to set, talk about how um, they're, the teachers just don't think they're being used effectively in the school and that they're, um, that they're being used more as a toy. And that's something that um, moving forward, a lot of um, a lot of uh, things that you see the iPad, and as you said before, you see the iPad, it's this great, it looks it looks like it's this great thing. You can pick it up and you can figure it out in five seconds, but that just, that doesn't necessarily always equate to um, learning and rather than, it, and it's being more used as a toy. And I've, even in our school, I've seen it used kind of, mm, yeah, I've seen it. One of the concerns of, of a teacher that I've been talking to is that a uh, people don't know how to use them in an educational setting because they use them in their personal lives as a toy. Um, and Michael, actually, you had some comments on that and some ideas about that? Sure. Well, you know, I've, I've been at the library long enough that I've, I started in 1997 when, you know, the internet was still relatively young and the library's internet PCs were just very few. And so I've seen the library go from a place where people thought that PCs in the library were kind of a fad and weren't really sure how useful they were and were pretty sure that they were just a toy. And so I've seen that evolve to there are there's a huge segment of library users all they do is come in and use the internet. We are the largest source of free internet in Mecklenburg County. And so I can see how the iPad is kind of a next generation of that where you have something that is very interesting, it's very flashy and can be a whole lot of fun um, it can also be used for education, for work, for creativity, but it's going to be up to these LA teachers and LA administrators to come up with the compelling things the students are supposed to do. You can't just hand someone an iPad and say, uh, learn. Uh, you have to show them how they're going to learn because the iPad does kind of come off as a toy originally and um, you're going to have to really come up with creative software and activities to make it into a tool. And one of the things, um, and I can, uh, from experience, because we have 25 iPads at my school, um, and one of the things that, um, there's an online service called IXL, which is a uh, math facts, and it has long, and it does long division, but um, it has an iPad app, and I would say it is probably one of the most engaging, and um, what it does is it puts it in the form of a competition, uh, between the students. So the students are assigned the work, but they're more often than not, they're encouraged to do more 
um, because of the because of the competition that's there, and they want to be the, they want to be in the lead. And I think there's prizes. I'm not 100% plugged into the program. I just I just basically set stuff up and let them roll with it. But um, but that's a very good example. And one of the things that I'm that I'm looking at and I'm starting to see is that a lot of these um, companies are starting to actually push. Uh, so a lot of these educational companies, and there are a ton of them. I can uh, two of them off the top of my head are IXL and um, a company called iStation, uh, which does online uh, reading testing. That they're starting to create iPad apps, and when you sit down and you think about it, it's going to be um, that. And you're right. As much as I am opposed to iPads, I still think that they're going to be great, just not immediately because were because we don't have the resources we don't and even though you might have the iPads you don't have the educational resources well that, I yeah I, I think you're on the right track with your math example uh, my son is seven years old in the second grade and he plays on a website called some dog s u m some dog and it's about mathematics and there is a highly competitive nature to while he's online doing these math games uh, he is competing against other kids also online doing math games and he has to do a certain amount of that time for school but he always does extra because it's fun and that's an example of you can meld that technology and fun together in a way that keeps kids engaged and makes them want to do it yeah and I mean it's just that's really what the whole idea of the iPad is about um, and we're just gonna, and as we move on, we're just gonna have to see where that really rolls yeah. in the future, because I honestly, as opposed to iPads as I am, I have to. Say, and Michael was saying, and I 100% agree with him, is that there is nothing easier to sit down and pick up in five seconds to figure out how to use it. Yeah. Um, because of the ease of use interface, and in addition to the fact that it's not, it's the best-selling tablet, and I would have to say Apple's done a very good job in keeping it with consistency in that nature um, with the whole thing and not having a fragmented market such as Android. Uh, but, you know, I think it, it's just going to, we're just going to have to see where it goes on from there. Um, and, yeah, and I mean, it's just, I think the whole, I think what's happening is, is there needs to be smaller deploy rather than the LA school district didn't just stick their toe in they they got up on the high dive and they dove into the into the pool um, and there were a few pilot schools but it, it was the same deal rather than starting with a you can check out these you can check out 30 iPads to use in your class they went right in and they said um, they went right in and they basically just said okay let's just we're gonna do it all, and we're gonna basically, and not even start. They're just gonna give them an iPad that they can basically use off the sure. date. It's their iPad. Um, yeah. Well, I know that even at even in libraries, uh, there are, you know there are uh, staff and administrators that want to. Usually, it's the iPad, but want to take that mobile experience and have a device that they can go out in the stacks and and help people without someone having to come to a desk and basically if as the as the software develops to where you can do already uh, my vendor Cersei Dynex is on the verge of having a product where on your iPad I could go into the stacks where you're looking at fiction and check in uh, check out your books to you they're on the iPad and that's all in development it'll be here in less than a year um, and that sounds great, but we still don't know how useful that's going to be. You know, it's, you, you think that if you want to take every function to every place in the building that it's going to be awesome, but until we put it into practice, we don't know if people want a staff member to walk up to them anywhere in a building and say, hey, I've got this thing, can I check your books out to you? Some people might love it, some people, I'll go to the desk when I'm ready. So it's all just so very new. Uh, what 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 mobile computing, both on the go and even in our own buildings, is going to let us do, and how people will take to it on both sides of the uh, transaction. 
Yeah, I know that personally, if that were to happen, um, I would walk out of the library with more books than I could carry. So, because <laughs> I'll um, because I'll just grab a whole bunch of books. So I'll sit at I'll sit at a table and I'll just go through them and see which ones I like and that sort of stuff. So, but I mean, yeah, it's really more about implementation um, with with anything and with any new thing. Like you, your example with PCs that they people thought they were a fad and it's really just going to be a matter of um, in a year or two years seeing where um, seeing where the educational market is with iPads and at this point um, a lot of people have actually billed this as one of the largest pub publicity stunts in the uh, in the history of publicity stunts as far as the LA school district is and at the very end of the article it says um, one of the administrators, um, the next time we cry for money, he said, this is going to be brought up as a big waste. And that just really drives home the fact that the LA school district dove in. And I'm not really, I'm just holding up the LA school district as an example because they are they are the only ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. They were well, the first. well and, and they are certainly huge. So probably, oh. I would guess they're second only to New York City public library, uh, public uh, schools. I, 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 um, I would no, guess. No, they're first. Oh, they're first. Okay. They're first. Oh uh, no, I don't know. They're third or second. I don't know. It's third, second, or first. It's like they're competing. The they're competing. They're all so close that it's. They're big. They're big. The wash. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah. But yeah. Okay. So now moving on to your area of expertise, Michael. Your mm -hmm. favorite thing in the whole world um, <laughs> is integrated library systems. And sure. Well, I'd say it's a little strong to say it's my favorite thing in the world. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah, but it has. Uh, I've been I've been the ILS administrator for the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library since 2008, and before that, uh, I've worked in uh, library technology since 1999. So, I've seen um, how things have changed in 14 years, and um, there is, uh, you know, I've I've heard on previous episodes you talk about ILSs, and you know, one of the things about having an ILS that We've been on Horizon now, which is our current ILS. It's a product by Cersei Dynex. We've been on Horizon since 2005. You're like, oh, that's nine years old. And has it changed much? No. It's changed a little. And when I hear people get the itch to replace Horizon, I have to ask them, number one, what is it they really want Horizon to do that it doesn't? And there's little things. No doubt there are little things. But when I look at the other ILSs out there that are a little bit newer, a little bit flashier, or in the case of open source ILS is a little bit freer for us to develop the way we want. When I look at them, are they really that much better or different than what we have? And that's and that's the thing that I think as an ILS administrator or as a library administrator you have to ask yourself, do you want something new because it's new or do you want something new because it's an improvement? And a lot of the new, uh, more current ILSs I see out there are I would say at best maybe 10 or 15 percent better than what I have and so at, at some point we will go to something else but you don't rush in to only a 10 percent improvement uh, because anytime you make a big change it's a change for your customers it's a change for your staff and it's a huge financial outlay and so um, it's been nice to have a stable uh, consistent ILS for these nine years but I do want to see it improve and we we're actually doing an upgrade of our ILS next month and that's just a version we're going from version 751 to 752 very small Riley you know that a dot 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 version upgrade is going to have very small improvements um, but one of the ones that we're going to get which seems small on the surface but it's a huge improvement is right now whenever you go to check things out at the library you have to have your library card uh, but if you check the book out yourself at one of our self-service stations you have to know your pin and the pin is usually the last four of your phone number but if you don't know what that pin is uh, you have to ask a staff member to help you and when you're accessing our site remotely from your house well there's no staff to ask and if we're closed because it's 11 o'clock at night there's no one who can help you with your pin number and you're kind of locked out until we open but uh, one of the improvements of our next version of Horizon is you'll be able to reset your pin and that seems like a really simple thing that every website has been able to have you reset your password for years uh, but for us that's not something we've had and 
that's one of those tiny little improvements, something that makes a software go from 751 to 752 that could have a big impact on our, on our customers. And so it's small improvements like that that um, keep my job interesting and make me feel like that uh, I make things better. And and I and I'm sure there's there's like seven five one dot x dot x as well, right? Like just having general security updates and bug sure. fixes. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah. But I mean that I never really thought about it because I have never changed my default pin. <laughs> Most luckily, people haven't. <laughs> luckily, none of you know my home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and I mean it's just something really. That that is really interesting. I I guess I just haven't noticed. Um, but I mean, it's incremental, and you are right. Mm -hmm. And what you can do with what you have now, and I know you all have the Aqua browser, um, which you were talking to me about before the show. Um, but rather than completely replacing your iOS with something um, like Koa, which has a which has a pretty UI compared to the um, default. Um, OPAC that comes with Horizons, you just put something, uh, a layer on top of Horizons, which you call your uh, newer catalog, and then you have the older OPAC that comes with Horizons. Right, right. Yeah, so we, we have uh, the, the, the catalog, the online catalog that comes with Horizon is called HIP for Horizon Information Portal. That's a, that's a very kind of 2003 name for something. And we call that our classic catalog. And then about four years ago, we got what's called, which is called a, a discovery layer tool. And what that is, it's another catalog that you can kind of put on top or next to your current catalog that's more powerful. And it, it uses different algorithms and a, a, a better looking design to present the same information as what your classic catalog does. So that's our enhanced catalog. And a lot of these ILS makers um, have come to realize, and even third party uh, companies have come to realize that. Uh, there's big business in, I might not be able to sell you an ILS, or I might be a company that doesn't even own an ILS to sell you, but I can sell you a really flashy, cool, powerful tool that makes it easier for your customers to use your ILS. And these discovery layer tools like Aqua Browser, like Biblio Commons, like uh, EBSCO Discovery Service, um, that's kind of where the big business is uh, in, in library land because uh, as I mentioned before, it's a big deal to change your ILS uh, for, for everyone involved, your customers, your staff, your IT people, uh, and it's a lot of money. But to, to put on something next to it that makes it a little bit better um, can make a huge improvement. And I think Aqua Browser, over the last four years, uh, people, have, people have enjoyed the power of it. Unfortunately, like a lot of these third-party products, it doesn't integrate fully. And so there are still reasons why people have to go back to the classic catalog to check on their holds, to see what their finds are about, to change their email address. And so as someone who has to maintain that system, now I have two catalogs. I have to make sure both of them are up all the time. And that's not the best solution. I'd rather have one awesome catalog than uh, one pretty good catalog and one OK catalog, which I think is what I have now. Yeah, and I mean, that that's like... and. There was another one that you just kind of wanted to touch on. It was called Viewfind. Can you explain for me exactly what sure. that is? Sure. Sure. So I, I know, Riley, that you're a, a fan of open source software. And uh, Viewfind is a, a discovery layer tool that was developed by uh, Villanova University. Villanova University is the view in Viewfind. And uh, it's an open source product that uh, more and more systems are starting to uh, develop. If you go to the, um, to the Wake County, the Raleigh Library System, uh, their primary online catalog is a viewfind catalog, and they have had that integrate with Horizon, the same ILS I have, um, and they were able to customize it in ways that I could never customize either one of my two uh, catalogs because they control the code. It's open source. They can do whatever they want. And uh, by the same token, not only can they customize it the way they want, but they're able to uh, use APIs to integrate with some of these services that offer eBooks a lot better than either one of my catalogs do either. And so if you have the, the, the expertise and the availability of staff to take an open source product and craft it to your needs, that's a very powerful combination uh, that more and more universities, uh, both university libraries and public libraries, are starting to embrace. 
And that, and I mean, that's a that's probably a very good example of using like open source because they they still use like something like Horizons, right? They're not full. Um, Wake County. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 The the viewfind is what sits on top of Horizon. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I guess that's just that's a really good example of um, trying to revamp your catalog for your um, for your page for your patrons without having to necessarily think about. Um, saying without having to make an entire change and still being able to have two, not necessarily two separate systems, but a system that integrates with your existing system that runs side by side. And something that, and something really actually just to keep in mind is that I think Jeff has been saying this for um, ever since we started to talk about iOS is how um, they have this, I can't remember, he, it was called something. And just something that you need to keep in mind is that if you have a, if you have something that just isn't working for you, um, regardless of, regar like, because Horizon sounds like it's been working for y'all and it's been working great, but Jeff has been saying that um, their library has this clunky system. I think it's got some kind of really complicated and generic sounding name, but he said that one of the things that they're, they're looking at a move to Koa, especially, mainly because... Um, it wasn't working for him, and that's something just to keep in mind when looking at these sort of things and saying, "Hey, even though the even though I um this is going to be a big shift, what I have right now just isn't doing it for me." And whether you move to open source or um or you move to a proprietary system, it doesn't matter as long as you're as long as it's important just to say this is what fits for me. Well, uh, yeah, and I think you you hit upon something that I expanded on earlier, and that is. Eventually, if, if Horizon stays mostly the same and a lot of its competitors continue to innovate, then eventually that 10 or 15% difference that I talked about before, it's going to grow. And the, the difference between what I have and what I could get, if that becomes 20 and 25%, or there's always the possibility that the, the software that you have could reach the end of its life. And, and, the, and the vendor can say, listen, I have a new product. Come and buy my new product. I'm not supporting your old one anymore. Much like uh, you and I discussed earlier, Riley, that Windows XP is reaching the end of its life in, in April. Uh, someday Horizon will too. And you know the, the goal is to have already moved on before they end of life your product. Um, but right now, financially, with you know the way that you know the country is just starting to come out of a bad recession that happened at the end of the last decade, and um, the, the 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 library's hours are not what they were four years ago, and our staffing is not what it was four years ago. And so, to 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 spend money to replace a system that mostly works, um, and still does a really good job, isn't the best use of funds. But someday it's going to be one of our most important use of funds. It's at at some point. Uh, yeah, and I definitely think that um, yeah, and I mean that's just important. If it's working for you, stick with it. Um, but yeah, and layering items like we talked about before with Viewfind or um, Aqua Browser is a good idea. Um, and I just had a quick question. I couldn't find. I I was looking and I didn't even think CRC Dynex was still selling Horizons because I couldn't even find it on their website. Right, and you 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 can find references to it, but yes, you cannot buy it. Um, as a matter of fact, in in the in the latter part of the last decade, say around 2008, 2009, uh, I think Cersei Dynex's plan was probably to completely phase Horizon out because what they did was is, is one company bought another and Cersei bought Dynex. Cersei had their own ILS, Dynex had Horizon, and uh, Dynex was working on continuing Horizon and, and going to uh, a next major version. Cersei Dynex bought them and said, you know what, we're going to go with our catalog and develop that for the future. And and ho hoping that all of us Horizon people come and come and buy it too. And it's called Symphony, and Symphony is a is is a fine ILS, um, and it's sold by the same vendor that that helps me with with Horizon. But then the economy went bad, and Cersei Dynamics realized, okay, we can't phase out Horizon because our customers cannot afford to go to something completely new, and we would lose tons of business. This is just my opinion, uh, and so you found that instead of killing Horizon. They realized, well, if we spend um, a little bit of time and continue to develop Horizon and make improvements, might be able to reset your PIN number, 
we can keep our horizon customers happy and little by little hopefully their goal is to have us buy their other product as well and a lot of horizon uh, systems have gone to symphony a lot of horizon cut systems have gone to all the other ILS's too um, and so I, I think that if if the recession had never happened I don't know the horizon would still be around now uh, at my library or anywhere else but things changed yeah because I was just taking a look on their website and yeah um, so my understanding symphony is um, completely is it cloud-based or is it on-site it can be both the even even horizon ours is all locally hosted but they do sell a software as a service hosting model where really horizon um, is really a, a cluster of five or six different servers that I have that have different jobs uh, including a server that just deals with people calling in on their phone and uh, listening to what books they have on hold um, different servers for these different catalogs we've been talking about uh, I have a server that all it does is generate reports and it takes all the information inside of Horizon slices and dices it and spits out reports about what kind of books people are checking out what kind of books we need to buy more of um, I could send almost all of that to the cloud and have Horizon host to have Cersei Dynix host it all um, but that costs a lot of money and uh, you know the the time to decide to go to the cloud usually for, for people like me happens okay my server is at the end do I buy a new server or do I go to the cloud and recently this summer we decided to buy a new server so going to the cloud wasn't quite ready for us yet and for a, and for a library of your size the question is part of it is is saying would it be would it be more cost effective to buy a new server or would it be more cost effective to go to the cloud and I would assume that with a library of your size it would be probably more cost effective just to have a locally hosted solution um, at the end of the day yeah and, and it's and like I said those those decisions happen um, when it's time to make a big server purchase and uh, and it just came down to the, the the amount that I pay them yearly for all of our maintenance would be significantly more if it was in the cloud and that's just not how I, how we need to spend our budget yeah and I mean because um, there's a there's the cloud is is as big is a big conversation everywhere mm -hmm. but you know you really just have to think about it is it gonna be is it sitting down if how many books do you does the public library in Charlotte have <laughs> Uh, we have, you know, just the other day, I want to say we have in our in our catalog, and that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these items uh, circulate or even still exist, because you have books that are constantly coming in and out of the catalog because we buy new ones, we we some get lost, some get weeded, about a million, let's say. And um, you know, another concern about the cloud for for every product, Riley, is uh, is the is the bandwidth and performance going to be there? And if if I have a server that's living in say St. Louis, Missouri, uh, that's talking to all of my computers here in Charlotte, is it going to be as responsive as a server here in Charlotte? And you know, you kind of your gut instinct is to say, well, no, it's not. Um, and so as as cloud services become more robust, more dependable, that's where everyone is going to go eventually. I would love not to have uh, these six or seven servers that I have to worry about. You know. Would I have to worry about if the hard drives die? Well, me or my colleagues have to worry about that. And it would be nice to not have to worry about hardware anymore. It'd be someone else's responsibility. Uh, but the cost and the proof that the performance will will be there, we just don't know that yet. And even even at my school, and we're we have 150 students, um, we actually are um, we we have an on-site server, and like most schools, um, probably. Most schools our size actually don't. We have an active, we have a, a domain, and we have an, a whole active directory and um, all that, all that fun stuff. And mm -hmm. we're actually um, getting rather than um, and all that stuff. And we're actually about to get a rack of servers. Um, wow, that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm excited. Right, I, right now I have all the servers, and they're currently stacked on a shelf, running, not. Yeah, but yeah, we're about to rack, get get a rack and all that stuff. And one of the my thoughts is we could move all of this to the cloud. But then my but then I came to the realization if we move this stuff to the cloud, you also have to like you were saying before responsiveness. But you for 150 students and more often than not, 
more at least two thirds of those are on a computer accessing the internet at any given time. You have to think about it. I'm going to have to not only will I have to pay this cloud service provider, I'm going to have to get a huge pipe to handle all this stuff. Yep. And and I mean we I th we have a I think we only have a 15 meg circuit. Um, and I mean right even right now that's not enough when yeah. we have stuff hosted online, but it's like it's simply just cost. We can't afford a bigger we can't afford a bigger circuit. Yeah. Um, I understand that. Mhm. Mm and faster internet is nice, but um, when you're going, when you have to have a business class connection, faster internet. Sure. Yeah, even even going up a couple couple megs, it can double. Uh, oh yeah, easily. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you know the 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 things that uh, concern my administration is not so much replacing Horizon, um, or even replacing something like Aqua Browser. It's can we have Aqua Browser hook into all of our ebook providers because that's and you know there's always going to be a reason to have books in your library but more and more people want to get that book read it on their device and uh, do it all from the comfort of their home and so really the 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 next big jump for for my organization is to have those online catalogs uh, make it a lot easier for you to check out your ebooks and audiobooks directly from services like Overdrive and neither one of my catalogs do that now what my catalogs will do is you 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 look at Pride and Prejudice or uh, The Help or whatever book you want and my catalog will say well I've got these they've got these physical copies at these branches or I've got these electronic copies and you click a link and it takes you to that vendor's website you take it you takes you to Overdrive's website and my goal is to not send you to Overdrive's website ever because it's really kind of hard to use and I want you to stay in my catalog and find everything you need and so that's that's where the next big step for these online catalogs will be is to try to integrate as many services as possible into one place to make it easy for people to not only find it but also use it and one of the things that I've always um, I've in particular and I'm sure this is the place of all the other services that I have not liked in particular at overdrive um, uh, and my and yeah, my understanding is that you get a contract with Overdrive. They don't they handle all the um, they handle all of the all of your. So basically, we're gonna they say we're gonna negotiate your prices for these books. You're gonna pay us this fee, and then you don't even get to negotiate directly with the publishers as you might with an actual book, right? Well, I'm not. I don't. I'm not in collections. I don't. I don't okay. order things. But but I believe that you're. That you're, if you're not right, you're mostly right, and that you know we we buy things from Overdrive, and then Overdrive negotiates with these publishers, and the publishers come up with rules like uh, the ebook only gets to circulate X amount of times, and even though we both know it's not a physical book, there's no reason it could circulate forever, uh, but they want to sell it again and again to us, and so the you know with 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 Overdrive we we buy X amount of copies. And so if I have uh, six copies of Huckleberry Finn, only six of my patrons can have Huckleberry Finn on their Kindle or on their iPad or whatever. We have another service that we use called Freeding. And Freeding has a, has a completely different model, and it's smaller than Overdrive. It doesn't have the collection that Overdrive does, because Overdrive has been around for a while, and it's the big dog. But what Freeding does is um, we, let, we let our patrons have a certain, I think it's three tokens a week, it might be five. And with those tokens, you go and decide how you want to spend them on Freeding's website. So a really popular ebook um, will, will will cost you more tokens, and then a less popular ebook might just cost you one. But I have endless copies of that ebook, and so if everybody wants the newest John Grisham book, and Freeding has it, all of my patrons can get it simultaneously, uh, as long as they have the uh, like the tokens, the coins to do it. And so I'm not. I don't. I don't limit what my what my how many patrons can have a title. The patrons are limited. Basically, I just give them an allowance, and they decide how they want to spend it on the site. And coming up with innovative uh, models like this is, I hope, the future. Because I think uh, that that definitely serves my patrons better when um, when 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 a wife is reading a book on her Kindle, and she can say, "Why don't you get this too?" And her spouse can go online and get the same book and not have to wait. 
until it's their turn. They just go over there and spend their tokens. Um, that really should be the future, and I hope it is, or something even better that uh, a site just haven't, hasn't even come up with yet. I think you might be muted, Riley. I don't hear you. Oh, oh my bad. I do that <laughs> sometimes. Because interference is stupid. Um, <laughs> uh, but so with Freeding, do you have to use Adobe Digital Editions? Because I haven't used that particular uh, thing. Or will, that, will they also work with like the Kindle? Um, let me see. You know, I don't know that Freeding works with a Kindle. I'd have to be honest. I am an audiobook guy. Not so much an e-reader guy. As am I. Yeah, and so I, I, I end up not using Freeding all that much myself. Um, and so I don't know the technical details. I, I do know that, that uh, OverDrive, um, well, Freeding does a much better job of, of helping our patrons with, with issues. And, and so I don't hear a lot about Freeding because it doesn't cause many problems for our patrons. Overdrive, because they've been around a while, they have an older model with limited amount of, of, of items that you can check out. But also, like you said, you have to have Adobe Digital Editions. And then there's this intricate matrix of uh, the, all the different hardware, which is great that you can read these books and listen to these audiobooks on so many different devices. But on, some titles are only available on certain, on certain formats that play on certain devices. And you have to have logins for Adobe and login for OverDrive. All of that is just way too complicated, and it's 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 ridiculous that you know I, I hate people that throw out the I can't believe in 2013 you still have to do this, but it really is ridiculous. In the 2013, we still have to wade this complex series of do I have to download it to my device or do I have to download it to my computer and then hook my device up with USB and move it that way it's really hard to expect someone to be able to figure that out. And as, as, your, as your Kindles and your iPads and your Android tablets become more and more prevalent because they get cheaper and cheaper and more and more people are comfortable with them, you know, you know Riley, every Christmas, in the aftermath of Christmas, my department has to deal with a ton of new overdrive people. Why? Everyone got Kindles for Christmas. Everyone got iPads for Christmas. And so we have these, these, these new users every year um, that are very excited about getting all their free ebooks, and then they get to the website and they see a lot of the titles they want. That's awesome, and then they go to the title they want, and maybe they have to wait for it, or maybe they don't. But even if they don't, there's all these hoops they have to jump through just to read the book, and that's not the future. And I've seen books that have had 150 holds on them, and I'm and I think I'm still on a few that. I've been waiting for two years. A couple John Grisham books, um, and are, are like I mean, there's like 200 people or 300 people that have holds on them, and I mean, it's just starting to get kind of ridiculous. And it's like, because one of the things that I've I've and I'm sure this isn't the case of everyone, but I know that like my sister has done this. Um, she has gotten a book on her Kindle. And then she just she'll finish it, and then she and if she finishes books in like a day, and so it will stay out there for two weeks or however long. And I mean that's just one of the things that that it because uh, an ebook isn't an actual book, and I understand the idea of limiting the number of physical copies, but I mean it's just some of these publishers are not. Um, it's just ridiculous. And just one thing on Freeding, I was I was on y'all's uh, the Freeding sh uh, CM Library website, and under the frequently asked questions, it explains how to sideload their app on the Kindle Fire. That's cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's I have cool. To say, yeah, I have to say that's actually pretty neat. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Riley, what what we're gonna see happen with with publishers and the book industry is the same thing we saw with music is you know those the, the the music industry embraced Apple and iTunes until Apple and iTunes got so big that they got afraid of them and then they realized you know what yeah there's piracy and yeah if we sell these this music without DRM people are going to give it to each other uh, but the people who want music for free they're going to go out and find it anyway uh, and they realized you know what if we take away all this DRM and just sell the music without it uh, people are more people are going to buy it, and I think that's what's going to happen both with with the with the movie industry 
and, and movie and television and eventually with these with these publishers is they're going to realize if we make it easy for people then people don't mind paying us some money or, or in the case of libraries selling uh, books at a reasonable rate to a library because the library can then buy more of them because it's a more useful item and that's going to happen eventually we just don't know when yeah and I mean it's and I mean I'm gonna and yeah if you want to if if the people who want the who want it for free, they're just going to go to Google, they're going to type in whatever, um, John Grisham, PDF, whatever, and there'll be 10 results. Uh, the, no, there'll be, there'll be hundreds of options for getting it for free. And it's just going to, it's just going to be, a, and a, how long was it? So iTunes launched, in two, uh, just using the iTunes, iTunes launched in 2002, they launched iTunes Plus in what, 2008 I think? And then they uh, and then I think they launched um, DRM free in like 2009 or something like that. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, maybe it's just going to be a while, um, yeah. but eventually it's going to get to the point that um, that this sort of stuff is going to be DRM free, and it's going to be easier for me to read it on my iPhone, read it on my um, read it on my Kindle, or uh, Read it on my Android tablet. Read it wherever I want, yeah. and just trust the trust the user. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and just if you if you if you give the people an easy to use product at a reasonable price, more people are going to buy it, and it's just going to take some time for the different industries to realize it. Yeah. And um, yeah. So uh, we are forty three minutes in. Uh, All right. Which is uh, we're only supposed to go 30, but that's perfectly okay. 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 Um, so I just kind of wanted to uh, wrap up with this. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for being part of this awesome thing that is the Library Tech Cast, and I want to thank Michael for joining us. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, why Jeff is not here is because he is sailing. He is very lucky, and he is currently sailing in the Pacific Ocean, I believe, um, with his brother. So he'll be back next week. But for now, I just wanted to remind everyone that you can find us on Twitter. We're at Library Tech Cast. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Library Tech Cast. You can also find us on Google Plus, google.com forward slash plus Library Tech Cast Live. It's kind of cut off by my owl there, but you can kind of see it. Um, but yeah, just for now, um, next week we're going to be, mm, I don't know, Friday 6.30, Friday 7, some, somewhere thereabouts. Uh, just follow us on Twitter to get that information. Um, and I just wanted to tell you where you can find me. You can find me um, not only at RileyChilds.net, but on Twitter. I'm at Rowdy Children. That's R-O-W-D-Y-C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N. And also, if you wanted to support me and support my trip um, that I'm going to be taking to Code for Lib to cover the podcast, I do website design for I do website design. Um, pu- fantastic, beautiful websites. Um, just go to RileyChilds.net and click on the Work tab. Um, that will help me. So for now, um, thanks everyone for joining us on the Library Tech Cast. I hope to see you next week. Um, just uh, Michael, do you have anything? Uh, where can people find you if they want to follow you and stuff? Uh, well, not? I'm you know, I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Michael Cosm M I C H A E L C O S M, and um, otherwise I'm at the library probably answering your overdrive question. Okay, um, well that's Michael answering your overdrive question, and for the R- Library TechCast, I'm Riley Childs. Michael, just say bye. Bye.